Hello everyone and welcome to uh, this week's online lecture. Before we get started with this week's material, I want to talk about some feedback items regarding the assignments that you have been uh, submitting. Um, just a, a few helpful tips uh, to hopefully uh, help uh, you in terms of your map design. Um, the first thing to talk about is uh, assignment specifications. It is really important that you read the assignment a number of times and making sure that you are uh, following these specifications. Um, there are a lot of hints in there that will help alleviate some frustration you feel. Uh, for example, on the pinnacle map, uh, the, the different bullet points told you what um, product to make things in and some of you were making things in the wrong product and experiencing frustration make sure that you're reading it carefully because it helps you avoid those kinds of frustrations additionally um, specifications are hugely important uh, because this is essentially what your client wants you to produce uh, so it's really important to make sure that you are adhering to them um, you know and but using your creativity in terms of, of pr producing a, a result of, of that the second thing to mention is visual hierarchy and this isn't something that we went over in great detail yet but you, you know that you've been asked about visual hierarchy in both of your um, map critiques of your fellow classmates and essentially visual hierarchy is the ordering of importance of ma uh, map items essentially it's what you want pe um, people's eye to be drawn to first and in um, map design generally the answer to that is you actually want it to go to the the, the main map the, uh, the, the one that is the most important map and then all the other elements are supporting elements that are uh, subtle and uh, kind of seen after that main map um, some of your uh, layouts do struggle with, with visual hierarchy um, because there's so much going on that you, you the, the the user doesn't necessarily know where to to uh, focus their attention. So try to make sure that you are um, giving the map the, the most importance. And there's, there's several different design um, things that you can do to, to help that. Like you can use things like drop shadows um, or um, things to make it kind of pop off the map like you have a subtle background and your map pops or, or, and so forth you can make it larger than other uh, elements so just make sure that you're really trying to um, make that uh, the main map of, of the assignment the, the most prominent thing on your layout um, many of you have added pictures uh, to your maps uh, largely because they're in the assignment specifications and also because sometimes that can help support uh, the, the map purpose but make sure if you do add a picture that it really does support the map purpose uh, for, for instance uh, for the Yellowstone assignment uh, that was about the super volcano it wasn't about the um, various um, uh, cool uh, stops in Yellowstone so make sure that you're making it about something that's volcano-ish not something about that's oh you like you really just like the the Grand Canyon and the Yellowstone and you want to put a picture in there it doesn't really fit make sure it's a tight fit and it supports the map purpose that's just not something that you're using for filler uh, because it, um, it uh, tends to distract and it tends to confuse your message um, Another thing that regarding pictures is uh, make sure that they're not pixelated. If you, a picture that you find that you think is fantastic and you add it and it's pixelated, don't use it. Um, it's it, it ruins a, a, a good map, and that's probably the quickest way of ruining a good map is to use a really poor digital picture. Um, so uh, my um, advice is uh, to make sure that you are finding um, a high quality photo to use. Uh, uh, on your map layouts. Um, text. Um, we've added text to both the, the super volcano and the pinnacle map. Make sure that you're using that text to tie your various elements on the piece of paper together and that in your text you're referring to uh, the, the maps, you're referring to the pictures, you're referring to the, the elevation profile. Make sure you incorporate all that in there to tie it all together for the map user so that you, um, they can see how everything is uh, in, in a uh, relates um, and then with that uh, you know make sure that you know if, if you say um, uh, something about the elevation profile of, of uh, the um, Hawk Mountain or the Hawk Mountain the pinnacle hike uh, that you refer 
to, to it uh, in your text, and then you also have that particular figure labeled properly. Um, another uh, item is scale bars. Um, not every map needs a scale bar, um, and I would argue that a lot of times, like a locator map, does not need one. It just is a distraction. So you're not really going to be using that to measure it. You're really looking to see where something is in the overall grand scheme of, of, of things. It's just essentially giving an, uh, the map user an idea of where it is in terms of a larger geography. So just be cognizant of, of that. And then also, like if you have two maps on a piece of paper and um, they're at the same scale, uh, you can get away with just using one uh, scale bar versus two. And it's not to say that you can't use two, it's just that sometimes in terms of your map design, it makes it much easier to only uh, use one. And that also goes um, with north arrows uh, that, uh, you know, you can, uh, you only have to use uh, one uh, with that. Um, and then map la labels. Uh, a couple of things about map labels. The, the first thing is the tendency when we label items is to take the default. Um, that's not always the best choice. And especially for labels that are really meant to be um, you know, just reference information. For example, let's say that I make a map of the hack service area, it's a 10 county area, and I make I, I label those uh, counties. I really only want that to, so I can just quickly figure out what the the uh, county is because we know a lot of us don't know our counties uh, and I would want it to be a little bit subtle so that the information that I'm trying to show in there pops off like the, the, where the campuses are and, and, and such. So I suggest uh, instead of using black for those kinds of labels, uh, use shades of gray. Uh, shades of gray can really be quite nice and uh, it makes the labels not smacky in the face when you're looking at the map. They're, they're just there as a nice um, detail. and. Also, in terms of map labels, uh, let's say um, we are making a map of something in uh, Pennsylvania, and actually the Hawk Mountain thing is a, a good example, um, that you have the state of Pennsylvania, and you're showing where uh, Hawk Mountain is, but then you're also showing the surrounding states. Make sure that those surrounding states aren't labeled in the same way as the main state, like you might make those labels smaller um, than uh, Pennsylvania, and you might make them a grayscale just so that, again, that they are subtle and then in the background. And then last, um, by default, ArcGIS labels uh, things using the standard label engine. Um, but there's also a Mapplex label engine that actually adds a lot of um, variety and options for you in terms of label options. There are two different places to find and switch to the Mapplex uh, label engine. Um, the first, is just by going to uh, your uh, data layer, going to properties, going to the general tab, and down here we can switch the label engine to Mapplex. Uh, additionally, you can turn on your uh, labeling toolbar and then go to labeling and then use Mapplex label engine. And what this does, as I said, it gives you um, more options for uh, labeling your f uh, features. And it also does something um, with uh, labels that's probably the most obvious thing that, that it does. Uh, let's say that we're making a map of where all the Pennsylvania community colleges are located. When you label them, each of the colleges, it, it puts the label on one line, regardless of how long of a title it is. So, um, like Harrisburg Area Community College, that's a really long title for something. And then, if you're making a map, sometimes that label can get in the way of, of other features. What Mapplex does automatically is it stacks your label so that it'll put Harrisburg Area on the top line and then Community College on the, the bottom too. Just neatens up your labels and makes your map much more readable. So, um, I do suggest that uh, you consider just turning on the Mapplex label engine from the very beginning of a project because it really helps in terms of giving you options. And I'll show you exactly what, what, what I mean in terms of the options. So let's say I just go to this uh, data layer and if I go to the labels tab here, um, if we hit placement properties, you can see what you have available here to you. You just have kind of like how labels, you can kind of say how labels will will be placed, uh, how to remove duplicates, and how uh, to uh, detect conflicts. Uh, so you really have m minimum uh, options there. When we turn on that Mapplex label engine, 
and go back to there and go to um, placement properties notice all these new options that you have and it just gives you so much more control over labels uh, and I think for a lot of us including me labels are one of the hardest things to um, to make look good uh, when you have all these features on the map you're trying to find the right positions for them so that you're not, not losing detail in some other area uh, they, labels can be tricky uh, depending on the project this really helps uh, with uh, some of those labeling issues that you may encounter so again I just suggest that you uh, turn that um, on from the get-go um, with um, any project that you begin. So going back to the lecture, tempting to go back to the lecture. There we go. What I'd like to talk about this week is um, the map design pro process and elements and map composition. Up until this point, we have uh, been learning different mapping techniques for symbolizing our data. Uh, so now we're going to kind of go back to talking again about the map design process and some of the considerations you should um, be thinking about as you are uh, designing a map. And you've seen this before, and this is essentially the steps for communicating map information. And this is essentially like the, the map design process, the, you know, things, uh, this is like an ordering of how to approach a, a, a particular map a, assignment. So step one would be consider what the real world distribution of the phenomena might look like, because it helps you kind of figure out how to extract abstract it on, on a map. And it's as simple sometimes as, okay, well, if I was making a map of schools, what kind of symbol would I use for that? So symbology is one of those things that you th think about at, at uh, step one. And then you don't go against, um, th th you know, uh, what that phenomenon might look like. So, so like if you are making a map of schools, you wouldn't use an, uh, an icon um, for um, like a hazmat location to represent that school because it makes no sense. So you have to consider what it looks like so that you can properly um, convey the information on the, the map. The second step would be to determine the map uh, purpose and its intended audience. And this is something that I've been asking in the critiques because sometimes that's something that, that can get lost when we're you know trying to put, get all this information in. We forget who we're doing this uh, for. So uh, sometimes you have to think about, well, when you're designing it, will my is my audience an expert audience? Is it a new audience? Um, you know, uh, what is their uh, level of competence with this particular item? And that helps you determine how to portray the data on uh, the map. And then also you have to remember the map's purpose, and that's key because if somebody comes and asks you to make a map showing the, the you know the hack service area and you're putting all this additional information on there just because you have it because you've, you you just want to put it there it can really confuse a map very quickly so you have to determine the, that purpose and its intended audience and then in step three you collect data that's appropriate for that map purpose and I think this is something that I was trying to convey in the Yellowstone uh, assignment in particular because I made you go get the, um, most of that data uh, though in the pinnacle assignment you weren't really asked to um, bring that much to the table in terms of data but you have to collect data that's appropriate for the map's a purpose and it's really easy to get lost in that especially when you're finding all this really cool data you're like wow that would be awesome to have on the map but it doesn't necessarily mean it should be be there so you have to start self-editing what, what uh, um, you put on your map and I think a lot of you probably found that in the Yellowstone assignment that there was a lot of cool data out there pertaining to Yellowstone it doesn't necessarily mean that it was something that should have been there though and then step four is what you've been doing you've been designing and constructing uh, the, the map um, based on the specifications or needs requirements of the, the particular client and then in step five uh, is what we've been doing with the map critiques but this is something I'm gonna suggest that you do um, uh, on your own um, with other um, co-workers or so forth when you do um, land a, a GIS job, make sure that you're determining whether or not the map was useful and informative. And this can be actually done in a very informal way sometimes. Uh, for example, let's say that I go to a meeting and I take a map along with me and 
all you see are these looks of confusion at the map. They're asking lots of questions and so forth because they don't understand it. That's a form of feedback that you can take. Like, well, they didn't really get this. I had to explain it quite a bit. Is there a better way for me of portraying the information that would have made it a little bit more understandable for them? So take that, you know, even the reaction that you get, even though it's not necessarily um, a form of feedback or critique, uh, just looking and seeing how the users interacted with it and to see what their level of comprehension or confusion was is, is a great uh, litmus test to see if your um, uh, map was successful. So again, um, one of the things that you have to think about is who are your map readers. Uh, if they're new to the, the information being mapped, try to keep it as simple as possible. If they're a little bit more familiar with the con the, the um, data and the information, you can make it a little bit more uh, complex. So you, you tailor it to the knowledge level of uh, your audience. And you also tailor it to the ability to read and the ability to see. And that might sound a little funny, but let's, um, I had a uh, friend um, when I worked um, at Brooks, back in Brooks County at, at Ag Land Preservation, who worked for the zoning department. And he was going on the public news channel to talk about their zoning um, map and their zoning plan and, and so forth for the county. And he didn't just make this tiny little map um, um, for the audience. He made this, you know, big 34 by 44 map. And normally on that, we probably, like, if we were just going to be viewing that on a wall, we wouldn't make labels really all that large. But knowing that this was going to be on TV and w where it was going to be, he made the labels really quite a bit larger so that they would be readable and it actually turned out to be a really successful map. So you have to think about, you know, how are you, is the map going to be used um, in, in order to make sure that it's going to be uh, successful. So this is the example of an expert audience versus a more novice audience. So say you're going to um, a public meeting to talk about the, the city's uh, utility and water uh, lines. Uh, the map on the right is really meant for a, 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 a simple map. It's meant for um, an audience that aren't experts on, you know, water utility lines. The map at the left, though, however, it has all the valves, the, the, the lines, and, and, and so forth. It's a little bit more detailed because the, the, the map audience would actually understand that. So if you're actually talk, talking, you work for American Water, and you're uh, talking with your company about the, the lines in Harrisburg, this would probably be a more appropriate map and probably more of the expectation of what they would want you to uh, produce uh, for that. And again, this is another example of a, a, a simple map and a more complex map looking at the geology of a particular quadrangle in New Mexico. Uh, the one at, on the, the left is really meant for uh, an audience that uh, doesn't necessarily know a lot about uh, uh, faults and uh, so forth. And then this one uh, it tells you a little bit more about the geology that's really meant for an expert audience. So again, knowing your audience will help you uh, pick what data needs to be uh, available on a map. Now, when I started out this uh, lecture, I, t I was talking about visual hierarchy. And visual hier hierarchy is essentially the ordering of importance of items on a map. Essentially, what do you want people to notice first and remember when they finish reading uh, the maps? So um, with the main information would be would pop, while the less important information would be background information and not take prominence like the, 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 the main uh, map. Um, there, the map purpose really depends, uh, determines what, what items are the, the most in, important. And sometimes it's not a map. Uh, I mean, in GIS, it's usually a map to, because that's kind of what we do. Like, in, like if, in, if we're just doing graphic design, uh, let's say that we were making an infographic um, uh, to um, kind of show what jobs and salaries and so forth are available in the geospatial technology uh, field. That obviously wouldn't be map information, that would be data information. So you have to just determine, okay, what's the most important thing that would have to pop on that particular uh, infographic? So all of these items that you see listed here are items that help um, support your map and our various map elements. And normally, these items down here, uh, all, from title down, all of those are supplementary 
information items and the other ones that should be a little bit more subtle than uh, the, the main maps and your inset maps. I would say this almost kind of lists almost the order in which they should be seen, again, depending on what you're trying to, to show. So um, you, I think a lot of you probably remember from intro that the, the the tendency for new map makers is to insert these humongous north arrows and that's where your eye goes and a lot of times when there's a big empty white space students will size the north arrow to fill in that white space and it's just horrifying uh, so north arrow it shouldn't be like the, the most important item on a map it should be just that subtle information that's in the, the background same with a lot of these other things and i think in some of your the feedback that i've given you on the yellowstone map you heard me talk about some of this like uh the, the sources um for, for instance that that shouldn't be the same size text as a regular uh, text box because it's not as important as um uh, as the, the the actual story that you're trying to tell, so th this should help you uh, potentially order your items in the the, the order of uh, importance. And this is um, just an example of a map that is, things are just kind of thrown on there. It's not necessarily arranged uh, in the best uh, way. And then this is, are two examples where um, the, the first one is emphasizing the vegetation a little bit more because they decided you know that's the main. Um, that's what they're trying to get across is uh, what is the vegetation like in the, in, uh, the Republic of Congo uh, and you can see that very clearly where uh, the, the layout on the right emphasizes the parks that are within the Congo forest. So you can see how um, the different um, theme of the map changes you know the, the thing that is the, the, the most in, in important. So I think you all have played with some of these decorative design elements, drop shadows, line styles for frames, background patterns, all these fun things. Um, and my advice on the decorative design elements is that you use them sparingly and you use those when appropriate. And the next slide I'm gonna show you kind of shows a, an instance of it being used over the, the top. So here we have the Joshua Tree National uh, Park Ecological Zones. And the map at the top is using many, many different decorative design elements and it is just completely overstylized. Uh, for example, um, you can see that it has a background and that background doesn't really help make the, the main map pop. You can actually kind of get drawn into the background almost first because it's kind of kind of interesting. Um, so that is something that is probably a little bit too much. Also, putting things like boxes or, or backgrounds around your different elements, that can be a little bit much. Make sure that there's a reason for it. If you have a nice empty space like you have here, there's no reason really to put a box around it because it just starts making your layout look really boxy rather than clean and neat and simple. And you notice the difference between the two that this one gets rid of, rid of all those kinds of boxes and, and makes a much smaller... Um, uh, use of the uh, different elements. This is a much more aesthetic uh, layout and it has a background that is nice and, and subtle uh, and so that the, the map information pops a, a little bit more. So uh, just avoid using um, some of those um, excessively de de decorated elements. I mean, it can, be, it can be a cool touch to put, you know, like a, a box around a legend but really a box around a legend should really occur only if you're actually putting it over map information. If you're putting it in an empty white area, it's probably not a good idea to put a box around it. And I think many of you have received that comment uh, from me and hopefully have found that it does actually look better when you remove that uh, box. Um, Another thing uh, that you've been doing quite a bit um, with the assignments is that you've been using um, uh, inset maps to show your uh, different uh, enlarged uh, areas and you can see just you know how zoom lines can affect uh, how a map looks um, on the top map I think at least for me my eye got, gets drawn first to those red lines uh, and that is the most prominent element on the whole map which really should be 
quite honestly, probably the least subtle element as you kind of see here. So when you're using like things like zoom lines um, to kind of pull out things, try to make those a little bit more subtle and not so uh, prominent so that they're just background information. Now, map projections in design. Um, we have talked about various map projections and the, the appropriate map projections for certain areas. And for us, the, the two biggies are what map projection the, the United States should be in and what map projection the, the state of Pennsylvania should be in. So um, in terms of the continental United States, uh, we would pick an outburst equal area or a landward uh, conformal conic. Uh, either one uh, works. And um, to show you an example of um, how um, differently the, a map projection can make a map look, this is actually a, one that is kind of using um, a, a map projection that does kind of the similar thing to Mercator, where it basically keeps directions true, but it really distorts um, a shape and, and size and, and so forth. You can see how the, the top here is completely straight, and here when we set it to um, a uh, equal area, it, it gives a much more accurate representation of the geography. And if you don't remember, the way to um, uh, change the display projection in ArcMap is to go to the data frame. Uh, uh, properties and notice that in this particular map, uh, the United States looks a little bit um, long and skinny and doesn't look quite right. What we can do is go to our data frame, go to the coordinate system tab, and then uh, select the appropriate um, coordinate system. Again, for the United States, you have two options you have land, landward conic conformal and outwards equal area. So we would go to project it and then continental, then North America, then we would scroll down to we see a Lambert, uh, and that's usually the one I pick, though you can uh, pick the, the equal area conic as, as well. Um, what is kind of neat, just to, for future reference, um, you do have this area where favorites are in, so at home um, the ones that you pick the most will start populating in here. If you're in the lab, um, since the computers uh, get wiped clean every time that they shut down, they won't save favorites. But at home, you're going to start seeing that this starts um, adding the ones that you use frequently uh, there. Um, so I'm going to actually go pick this and hit OK and hit Yes. And now we have the United States looking a little bit more like what we're uh, used to uh, seeing. So in your map design, um, in terms of, of uh, making sure that your data is in the, the correct, that your display is in the correct projection, if you just kind of follow the, the rule of thumb that continental um, the United States is usually that outburst equal area or Lambert, um, you'll be fine. And then for the state of Pennsylvania, you can just use Pennsylvania State Plain. Um, when, if you are, do start making maps for other uh, states, I would suggest just using your state plane. If you're making things on a national or worldwide, um, I always like the UTM, Universal Transfer Mercator. Um, you can use that. If you, like, let's say, making a map of Denmark um, and you don't know which uh, to use, it's just as simple as doing some, some research on what are the common coordinate systems for a particular area. And you, you can usually find uh, the answer to that relatively uh, easily. So the next concept I, I want to talk about in terms of map design is uh, uh, producing a balanced layout. Um, and I think this is actually something uh, that takes a little bit of time to be able to produce a very nicely balanced layouts. But essentially what you're trying to do is to maximize the usage of the space that you have available, your paper space, your map space, so that you're filling it in um, you know, with uh, an important uh, in information. Not that you want it to be too uh, cluttered because you know something like this it is a little bit cluttery and it kind of says that it's a compact layout. This, I tend to be a fan of this type of, of uh, layouts um, where it's a kind of a looser layout. Um, 
because, because it just is to me a little bit more simple and clean than this one. Although um, I think both are can 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 be fine. But the idea is to just maximize the use of, of your space. Um, in some of the maps that have been submitted, there are times like that there's a whole area that's completely white. And I understand that you just don't want to just put anything in there just for the sake of filling it in. But perhaps it needs to kind of rethink um, the layout of your map to better fill in and utilize the, the space that is uh, available. And one of the things you can do, and I, I do this a lot of times, some data, you kind of know what map orientation you have to use. For example, if you're making a map of the United States or the map of Pennsylvania, since um, the data for Pennsylvania is like um, like a landscape orientation and the, the same as for the United States, it's, the tendency is to pick that um, landscape orientation. Um, so, but sometimes you have some flexibility in terms of what you're using, if it's portrait or landscape. And if you're having some problems with balance, try to sw switching up the um, orientation of the paper because that could be something that uh, helps you um, fill the, the, the space in uh, just a little bit better. So in terms of uh, refining um, a layout, um, I think all of you remember um, from um, intro that there are uh, some really good tools that help us uh, refine a, a layout. And I'm going to use these two just as a, an example. One of the things that um, you might want to do is make your data frames the same size. And if you remember, if you just click on uh, the, the two of them, right click, and go to distribute, make same size, that they are made the same size. And what will happen is it will make it the same size of the last one that you um, have selected. And then what you can do if you want your data to fill in that a particular data frame, just zoom to layer. And um, I would have actually kind of resized this differently if uh, I would have made it a little bit more uh, a landscape rather than a, a portrait but you can see how you can make those um, uh, the same size and then one of the things that you want to think about are alignments because alignments are really important and though misalignment might not look like a big deal on screen when you print them out those misalignments become really apparent so what you can do is right click on it and go to align and this one I'm just going to align left so that they're lined up here and then let's say that we had three of these I'm just going to copy one of these and let's say that we have three of these and let me realign those again and actually uh, make them the same size again and realign. Oops, wrong one. Notice that the space in between them is not the same and that you want the space all to be the same. What you can do is go to uh, distribute, distribute vertically, and it makes those the same um, size uh, gap in between. So the point that I'm trying to make here is there's a lot of tools available to you um, in, in your context menu. If you right click on your uh, data frame, all of these things are here that really can um, be quite nice. Um, what you might want to do is group things after you do have them aligned so that they, you, they move as one unit so that you don't have to keep um, realigning and, and uh, so, so forth. The other thing a lot of you have asked about is how to get rid of this line around here. And again, that's just going to your properties and going to your uh, frame tab and changing that to none. And that gets rid of it. And this is where you would add a background or drop shadow or anything like that, should you choose uh, to do that. But there are a lot of options available uh, in here uh, for that. One tool that I want to show you how to use and I don't have the best data here for showing it, but I just want to show you nonetheless, um, is what's called um, your data frame tools uh, toolbar. And let's say that you're trying to, you need to shift your layout. Oops, I'm getting a little bit swingy here. And you want to make that really more uh, to fill in the, the box. You can actually rotate your data frame. And what's kind of neat is when you add your, um, North arrow, I'm just going to pick a random one here. Okay. 
notice how it adds the north arrow based on the way that I spun the map. So this is really good when you have um, geographies that are kind of like on a diagonal, like midtown. Like when if we just cut out midtown uh, neighborhood, it's actually at an, an, an angle uh, that's um, like from like like this, and that isn't necessarily. It's hard to fit diagonal options or diagonal maps into a data frame so what you can do is spin it and that's the same with anybody that's working on the camp has worked at the camp curtain project that's also uh, something uh, that you can do for that area and i gotta go activate my light So in terms of refining your layout, there's a lot of those kinds of tools uh, that um, e exist to help you uh, deal with some of those um, misalignments and uh, so forth. The other thing that I suggest, um, and this is for every GIS class that you take, I can't possibly show you every tool that is in this product. There are so many. And at this point, just be click happy and see what happens when you, you, you do things. It's all about experimenting on what works um, and, and seeing what different tools uh, do. It's also just researching things. If you're trying to uh, create a specific effect, doing just um, research on the internet or via ArcMap Help to get you to, to make that. And then critique. Um, not only should you take our critiques, your classmates' critiques and my critiques, critique your map your, yourself uh, because there's there are ways of, of, of uh, doing that. You can just, um, and I'll get into that in a second, but there's multiple um, options for map uh, critique. Now, in terms of map export, you've been exporting your maps as PDFs. Uh, and you, as you know, there are multiple ways of exporting a, a map. Um, and depending on what you're going to be using it for, it, you might not always need a PDF. You might need it in some different uh, uh, format. In terms of raster export formats, there's TIFFs, JPEGs, and bitmaps. And you, probably the most popular um, to export is as a JPEG. Now, to, wh why we would export as uh, this format is uh, JPEGs, TIFFs, bitmaps are best used like if you're going to be inserting it into a PowerPoint presentation, a Word document, um, anything like that, that's generally the, the best uh, format. Um, but one of the things you have to consider with that is the, the quality of the export and the file size with that. Um, by default in ArcMap, when you export a J to a JPEG, it's 96 DPI, which creates something that looks like this top map here. Notice the, the pixelization of your features, and it really creates a really just a crappy export. And so what I would suggest is that when you do export out of ArcGIS in a JPEG format, 200 should be the minimum DPI that you use. And I think that's actually probably to me, that's what I use all the time, almost for everything, unless I know that I need something that's really a high, needs to be high resolution because it's going to be printed. Um, an example, um, about a year ago, I made a map for the, the president's boardroom of the state of Pennsylvania showing where all the community colleges were and where all the campuses were in the hack service area and where the hack service area was. And this was printed, it was like four feet high and I think eight feet long. So it was a huge map. And if I would have exported that out at a 200 DPI and it was going to print, it probably wouldn't be a very good print. And so I exported it at 600 DPI. It made for a large file. However, it made it so that it could be printed very uh, clearly. Um, so you got to consider how it's going to be used. Like if I would be putting something on the internet, like if, if I was going to be putting that same boardroom or that's the same map that I made for the boardroom, I would probably export it at 200 dpi and uh, make it um, a much smaller uh, map. Uh, so um, in terms of, uh, of JPEGs, uh, 200 is uh, the best. And there are some vector export options and these are used a lot of times when you need to get things out of ArcGIS, obviously. If you want to take things to like Adobe Illustrator, because Illustrator and Photoshop have a lot more um, 
design and graphic capabilities. Uh, there is an AI to take it to Adobe Illustrator. Uh, there's the EPS uh, and there's the EMF. Um, some of you may have noticed that not when you export your map, sometimes some of your map elements move and sometimes they look different. And that's in particular, I'm kind of referring to PDFs uh, here. And that's not uncommon. And that's actually kind of just a weakness in, this, in the software and in the export process. Um, the um, PDFs um, will, you know, uh, change um, some positioning. Sometimes the fonts will change if like you are um, the, um, exporting it and PDF doesn't support that particular font. Sometimes that will change your font. Um, and one thing that is probably the biggest issue with PDFs is that, and this happens with rasters. So, um, you might have like a raster background, like a base map, or like you found a really cool image that you're using as your background. In Arc Map, it shows up, but then you go and export it, and you have this white background, and you're like, well, what the heck happened to my background? It's not there. And that's one of the weaknesses of PDFs that it, it really has a hard time with those rasters. So the alternative to that is to export it as a JPEG, or one of the ones that I uh, suggest when there are issues with both um, JPEG and uh, PDF, uh, the EMF tends to be a really solid choice. So if you are having some issues with export, uh, play around with some of these options um, because no one is perfect. No, not one of these options is, per is perfect. It's all, they all have their little issues and it can be really frustrating when you're trying to make a des design a really cool map and get and you're done, you, you want to get it out and it's, and it's just not exporting the way that you had hoped. Um, a lot of you experienced this in the intro class when you did, did that geologic um, hazards map that was um, had a lot of base maps in it had a lot of images so PDFing it sometimes didn't go uh, so well so an EMF is a, a nice alternative uh, to that but the point that I'm trying to make here is number one make sure that you are selecting um, you're not going with a default resolution you're just as making sure that you're putting it in there uh, for JPEGs 200 minimum I, for PDFs I do 300 uh, just so that you have sharp looking um, exports uh, from your uh, arc map um, now in terms of map production um, it's important to think about if you are going to be reproducing your map uh, for whatever reason that you uh, think about some of the considerations that go along with map producing a map. Um, you know, how n your map is going to be used and how often it will be reproduced because that all has a cost to it. Um, consider like what your budget is, your deadline, and the media. Is it going to be a web map? Is it going to be a printed map? Is it going to be a PDF? You know, essentially, how are you going to use this map? Uh, what size sh uh, sh uh, should it be? Is it going to be color or black and white? How many copies are you going to need? Can your plotter and printer handle it? Because like, some, again, like just with the PDF problem that I told you about, sometimes when you go to print things, sometimes the, the plotter or the printer can't handle it and only prints out part of your, your map. Um, think about if, if the map will be folded and what is the quality of uh, display that's acceptable. And something to kind of go back up here, uh, when in my previous jobs, um, my very first job in GIS, I was working at Bighorn Canyon. And um, Bighorn Canyon was a, a, a lake, and um, whenever I would design my maps, I would make the lake blue. It was really pretty blue color, and my boss was like, "Would you stop making that blue? Because that just sucks the ink out of uh, the, the 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 printer, and the the, uh, the cartridges cost a lot of money." So even little silly things like that, you have to consider. It's like how how much is this going to cost to reproduce? Is it really a smart idea to to use that particular? Um, a thing for your, your map so um, just plan ahead on how things are going to be uh, used because it'll just save you some grief uh, later on in uh, the process in terms of of editing your map it's always a good idea obviously to self edit just like if you were writing a paper you would want to read it again and look for typos and 
um, sentence fragments and improper use of grammar. The same thing goes for producing a map. You want to make sure that you it's complete, that you met all the specifications of the assignment, uh, that the map design is something that helps your audience um, understand it and it makes your purpose be known, and that it's, it's accurate, that your, your, the data that you're using is not misleading and is not in, in, incorrect. And when you're working on a map, sometimes you're looking at it for hours and hours and you, you don't see things. Like even like when sometimes I write an email, I read it 26 times to make sure that there's no errors in it. And then the second I send it, I realize, ah, hey, I put PM instead of AM, uh, you know, th things like that. So sometimes um, looking at, at your map with a, a set of fresh eyes is a good idea. Walk away for, for a little bit and then come back and critique it because um, it just, you just can see things a little bit better at that point. And then edit your map in sections. And what you can kind of do is create like um, quadrangles on your map and do it in little squares, just kind of moving across to make sure that you're hitting everything on the map to make sure that you've looked at uh, every little uh, small uh, detail. And viewing maps from different perspectives, upside down, like, you know, turn the map around to see, you know, if, if something uh, pops out or something like that. And then, of course, always have somebody else look at it and give you uh, feedback. Um, sometimes this is possible, sometimes it's not. I know it's hard uh, for you guys not being in a face-to-face -face session to have somebody else look at it. But even if you want to, somebody to look at your map and, and give you feedback, put it on a discussion board and who's ever available could potentially comment on um, the, your, your map just to give you a little bit of feedback. And I'm going to skip that. So what I'd like to uh, transition into now is map generalization. And this is essentially... Um, a topic that's really important because as you're designing maps, sometimes you have to simplify the, the, the data and the, the content on the map to make it easier for your um, users to understand. So essentially what map generalization is, is the reduction of detail to enhance the point of your map. And it's essentially strategically reducing detail and grouping like phenomena to, uh, together. So this is a, a, a map that was uh, used um, on a brochure for a particular restaurant, Rory's Restaurant. <clears throat> and this map that you see here, excuse me, <coughs> the, the map that you see here has um, probably too many labels on it. You could get away with just one or the other on these. And this road isn't really overly important in terms of where the um, Roy's restaurant is located. So there's really no need to uh, label that. So, and then getting rid of some of these secondary roads is, is a good idea. And then it just makes it so much easier to read, uh, you know, the, the where something is located. So it's just uh, reducing detail to make the point of uh, your map. So the different types of map generalization that we're going to talk about are selection, simplification, smoothing, placement, enhancement, and dimension change. So the first um, generalization um, uh, concept is selection. Uh, is the feature necessary to make your point? Um, so like in that previous um, map, Are all these features necessary to make the point that you're trying to make? Uh, so you have to ask yourself that question. And if you do remove that feature, will it make the map harder to understand? Or will it just essentially not really matter? And do the important uh, features uh, stand out? Does it make for a less cluttered map? So um, in arc map, there's a couple of ways of, of selection um, or some tools that help um, facilitate selection. Um, one is a definition query. Say that you have um, a map of Harrisburg, you have the crime data, that's all the crime in 2015 up until this point, and, but you only need to, you only want the motor vehicle thefts, you can do a display or a definition query just to select out those. So um, that's one um, very useful uh, tool. Another tool that I think is really nice and one that I hope you really get savvy using because it really helps clean up maps a bit and make them look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing is the um, 
dissolve tool. We learned how to use dissolve in intro, but essentially what a dissolve does, it aggregates a, um, a map based on a particular field in the attribute uh, table. So in this case, if we open up the uh, attribute table for Bethel Township, um, we see that it has a class field, and the class field is giving what type of land use it's in. So the E stands for exempt, the R for residential, and so forth. So if we would then symbolize this by um, the land use, we would get something like this. And it would help if I activated that. You would get something like this. And what you would see is, yes, we have a land use map, but you're also seeing the various lines in between uh, the, um, the, you're still seeing the property lines, and you might want something that's a little bit smoother looking uh, to represent land use. So what we can do is use the dissolve tool. And what we can do is select the, the feature that we're dissolving, which is Bethel Township. Uh, we uh, give it a name and put it out a file path and make sure that you're being very cognizant of where you're saving things. I'm saving mine into my uh, folder that I created to dump um, just example data uh, in. And I'm going to call this uh, land use. And then I can choose to calculate a statistics field. Though I like doing this just because I'm a data nerd. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just uh, go to acreage. And then I'm going to calculate the sum of uh, the acreage so that I also have that as a field in the attribute table. If I hit run or OK, you see the tool running down here. And now we get something that looks like this. Now, if I go and symbolize this, ah, I made a mistake. <laughs> I sim yeah, I made a mistake. Um, let me do that again. So, dissolve. Uh, select the, the um, input, name your data. I'm going to name that land use one since I already used land use. And what I forgot to do was I forgot to select the class field in here because I was so eager to get to my statistics. So go down here, select class, select um, acreage, and then sum, and then hit OK. Run the tool again. Now we get something that looks like this and looks a little bit more correct. Um, now, if I would go to my attribute table, all it kept was the class field because that's the the um, field that I aggregated the, the data on, and then there's my sum of acreage for each of the uh, land uses, um, just because I like having it. So now, if we go and symbolize this by the class field. We get something that looks like that. Now, if I toggle this on and off, notice the difference. It just basically makes for a little bit of a cleaner looking map is what a dissolve does. So you can pick any field in the attribute table to dissolve upon so that it groups those uh, values into one polygon rather than multiple uh, polygons. So it's a really handy tool. I'm, it's actually a tool that I use a ton to essentially take data that I already have and, and create another data set uh, from it. Actually, I'll do another example just because these are fun. Um, another good example of this is uh, from the city of Harrisburg. And let's go to parcels. So these are parcels from, these are actually old parcels. These are from like 04. Um, and let me zoom in a layer on that. And if we look in this attribute table, 
one of the fields that's in there is the flood zone field uh, and you have either an A, B or C. A means it's, that it's in 100 year flood zone, B is in the 500 and C is undetermined. So right now, if again, if we would make a map showing this by flood zone, we get something that looks like this. And I would say this is where it's a really good idea to get rid of the outlines of your um, parcels because that gray is really um, masking the actual values bec uh, because of the scale of it. So in here, I would just uh, right click on any one of the symbols and go to um, properties for all symbols and just remove the color from the outline. It just makes for a prettier looking map um, when, when you do that. But what we can do also is want to dissolve to make a, a nice looking um, flood zone map from this. So we select parcels, uh, we name it and put it where we want, and then we select the field that we're going to dissolve upon. And again, uh, yeah, I'll skip this for this time. Um, we're going to just uh, hit OK. And then we get something that looks like this. And again, if we symbolize it by flood zone, we move those symbol uh, those outlines. And I, I need to do that for all. Okay. And I still do that for all of them. And we get something that just looks a little bit cleaner than the other. So the, the point of dissolve is to sim simplify your data. It just makes it look a little bit neater. Now, one last example that I'm going to show you with that um, before I stop talking about this topic is how to generate outlines of something or boundaries from something that already exists. So let's say that you are making a map uh, for Bethel Township that just shows where the different towns are located and you just need it like a simple outline of, the, of Bethel Township. You didn't need any of this kind of stuff. Um, you can use this to generate a boundary. So what you would do is instead of uh, when you want to dissolve for Bethel, just don't pick any dissolve fields and then hit OK. No, I actually didn't. This was a bad choice. Let's actually do um, Pennsylvania for this. Actually, I just pick this one and zoom to layer. So if we just wanted to get an outline of Pennsylvania from this, we could run that dissolve on that. And notice that you just get an outline of Pennsylvania. So it's a way of, of generating boundary files from something that already exists. So simplification essentially means um, can a, a, a feature be simplified and still be recognized? Does the removal of detail remove any vital information? And does simplification make the feature more noticeable? Or does it make it the, the, and make the map less cluttered? An example of that is this. Um, th this is actually having like the uh, very rigid boundaries of the, the various towns. This is actually just simplifying that a, a, a bit so that it looks a little bit uh, cleaner. Uh, so um, there are tools in our toolbox that I'll get to in, in a second that actually allow you to, to do uh, some of that, uh, as well as smoothing. Uh, smoothing just reduces the angularity of 
of your data uh, and it's usually good on roads rivers and sh streams so essentially so you if you get something that looks like this with your um you have a, a a river that looks like that, you can run smoothing that actually really rounds out those edges. And this is a tool that I use quite a bit. Um, I, every semester we map all hack students, and then we draw a polygon around where 90% of those students live in, so that that polygon is really angular and everything. And then I run a smoothing option on it that makes a little it rounds out those edges. Uh, the place where you find those options are in um, your Arc Toolbox under cartography tools, generalization, and then smooth polygon, smooth line, and, uh, and simplify, and so forth. So this is where you would find those tools should you find that you uh, need them. And they're very intuitive to use. Um, and one thing about tools, if, in case you haven't uh, really been doing this, um, I always keep this open so that it tells me what the tool does and then when you click in each one of these it tells you what is needed in that particular area so it really walks you through the, the process and then also there's the tool help down here if you need any further information and a lot of times they give you really good examples of when you would employ that tool or use that tool but just like with and, and uh, you know this is a, an analogy I made in other classes um, just like you know you may not you may know what a hammer is is used for uh, generally but sometimes you have creative uses for that hammer uh, and, and you use it for things that it really wasn't meant for you can do this kind of the same thing with ArcGIS tools it's just really up to your creativity on how to apply the tool to get the end result that you're trying to achieve uh, so there are probably a lot of these tools in the toolbox that I've used in non-traditional ways uh, just to achieve the result that I um, I need uh, for a particular uh, case. So displacement. Um, this is basically where you have uh, things that you know they, they kind of come on top of uh, each other, um, and this is kind of a way of making it look better. And again, in Arc Toolbox, they are in that same uh, category of tools. Uh, or dis displacement tools uh, so that you can create things that look uh, like that. Uh, enhancement, this is just adding detail um, uh, to um, a map. Like, and this like is, is a, a good example of this would be the pinnacle map that you did. Like, so uh, when they would be interested in the, the, the detail of the trail, whereas um, you know this is not really a good uh, detail. It doesn't really give you the full effect of the uh, trail. And this is actually one of the most used things that I do in terms of generalization is dimensional change. Is say you have something as polygons that you need to get to points. And a really good example of this is cities, because the cities often are in polygons um, that, that you can get to get the, the you know like the boundary and everything. But sometimes you don't need that depending on the scale. You need just a point showing where something is. And I'll show you an example of, of that. Uh, we'll go to this one. So this is the United States, obviously. And these um, Things that you see here, AFA, those are Acres for America projects. So what that is, it's that's um, a program that the Fish and Wildlife Service, in collaboration with Walmart of all places, has set up. Um, Walmart actually will preserve the same number of acres or more in uh, some. Uh, natural area as it, it constructs for, with each store parking lot so like they take 60 acres in, in parking lot in one place somewhere else in the country they'll preserve 60 acres of uh, of land uh, in exchange for for doing that so it's it's a pr thing for them uh, essentially so and this is actually a project i worked on uh last uh, spring uh, as a side gig um but let's say that we have one of the maps I was asked to make was a map showing where all the Acres for America projects were in the United States, and what I was I had I was working with was a polygon layer that gave act, the actual boundaries of the particular project. Obviously, some of them are so small that you can barely even see them see them at, at all. So th this really doesn't work for the map. So what you can do is um, convert the polygons to points. Now. 
a, a GIS term to be familiar with is centroid. Centroid is like the middle point of a polygon. So essentially you're creating the centroids of each of the um, Acres for America areas. So uh, what you can do is you can do a, a search. And for those of you that um, haven't used this, search is awesome for get, getting things. I searched on Centroid, and there's a tool here called Feature to Point in the Data Management Toolbox. So essentially, we would go to, you know, here Data Management uh, Toolbox, and then that was. Um, under generalization, I think you can do it in there. There's some other places, but I'm just gonna actually go to it right from here. Uh, you can click on the tool, it opens, input your polygons, tell it where you're uh, saving it. I'm just gonna keep the default for now. Hit okay, tool runs, it pops the points on there, which you can see, you can take off that, and then you can kind of symbolize these however you think is appropriate. Um, and you know, appropriate size and all that is way too big, but uh, you get the idea of, of what this tool does. So it's a really handy tool to have available because you, you use it quite a bit. Okay, and uh, this is just something I'm mentioning, into, and it falls under generalization, but this is just something uh, as a reminder. A lot of the maps that you're making, you need some type of base map behind it just to give geographic reference. And when you're using the imagery, it can be a bit much because it kind of distracts from the data that you're trying to put on it. Setting a transparency to, to your aerial photos or your base map can be really just a, a nice effect. And if you remember, you can do that in your layer properties on your display tab. Uh, it allows you to set a transparency. And even if you have to play with brightness and contrast, that's where you can, can uh, do it there. So just keep that in mind uh, about um, uh, transparency when using uh, base maps. Now this is uh, uh, um, my one of my favorite generalization techniques as well um, and it's the use of buffering to create really pretty looking roads and I'm actually going to do this for the Harrisburg City roads and let me add a data frame and add that Harrisburg data. So here we have Harrisburg roads, and I'm actually just going to zoom into like this area here so we can kind of see things. Um, a lot of times when you're making very simple maps, let's say that I was having you um, create a pub crawl map for Midtown Harrisburg, and you had to basically just put like where the stops on the crawl are in the roads so that people knew how to get there. Using roads like this aren't very pretty, but a way to pretty them up a bit is by buffering them. So like a, um, a street is about, you know, 20 feet wide. So we can go to um, a, a buffer, select the roads. I'm just going to keep that the default, put 20 feet in, and then hit OK. Um, and I'm actually going to dissolve all. And that just basically dissolves the so it doesn't buffer every single line segment, it buffers it as a whole. It looks much cleaner and neater. So now that this ran, I'm gonna turn off my other roads. See what this does. And then like what you can do is like you can even like hollow that out. So you have like a, just a general road network and so forth. It just makes for a, a nice uh, set of roads. And if you actually look in your base maps, if you have the streets base map, or, or anything that's dealing with roads, you're going to see that this is kind of how they represent roads uh, on lots of maps is by polygons rather than lines. So using the buffer tool helps you uh, create um, a nice effect uh, for your maps. I'm a little click happy today. Um, some of you, um, and I think probably all of you have done this before, but in case you don't remember, you can do something that's called a clip data frame. Essentially, like if you want your data frame in the shape of something, you can actually clip it to either the outline of features or the outline of a selected uh, 
of graphics. And I'll show you an example of doing this. And again, I'm going to sort a data frame. And I'll add data that we worked with in intro from Johnstown. And one more data set. A couple more. So then these are all the aerials for Johnstown that intersect the park. And I'm going to hollow out Johnstown because we don't keep those solid. So let's say that we just want to show that, that which is inside the Johnstown boundary. This isn't something I would actually do in this particular example. Um, I think it's also important to see what's outside a boundary uh, in a lot of cases, so I wouldn't want to really isolate it just to what's in. But if you wanted to do that, what you can do is you can go to your uh, data frame properties, your data frame tab, select uh, the clip options to clip to shape, and then you specify the shape. You can do it on the outline of features or the outline of graphics because there are no selected graphics in it. We're going to select that and we're going to do it to the Johnstown boundary and voila we see what happens. Um, if you don't like it you're not stuck with that all you have to go back and do is just to say no clipping and it takes it away and it's back to normal. The other thing you can do and I'm going to turn off that boundary you can draw a shape on uh, the map. So let's say that we draw any shape that we like. I'm drawing a really crappy star. Let's say that we want to clip it in the shape, which I certainly hope none of you do, but we can um, go here, go back to clip to shape, specify shape, uh, outline of selected graphics, hit OK, and OK again. We delete our graphic. And there we have our data in the shape that we specified. And that actually, this I actually use this a lot more than the feature just because I can, you can really specify exactly what you want. So again, you can um, remove that if you so choose. But I just want to remind you of the clip to shape option because and for some of the projects you've been working on, uh, that is actually a very viable option. So with that, that ends uh, this week's lecture. Um, your assignment is going to have you um, creating a map, um, uh, applying some of the generalization concepts that we talked about. It's going to be seem to be a very simple map, but sometimes those simple maps are the hardest ones just to create. Um, so good luck with this week's assignment, and post to the discussion board if you have questions, or email me directly. Have a good week.